to All Souls Langham Place. I want to wish you a very happy Christmas wherever in the world you're joining us from. Thank you for taking the time to be with us as we tell the Christmas story with music and readings from here in the centre of London. 
If you know the carols, please join in and sing along at home. If not, enjoy the music and listen to the words as we tell the story. Whatever the Christmas traditions are in your home, we are so glad you've joined us to hear this story of good news for all people. So as we come together at this Christmas tide, let it be our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels. And in heart and mind, think back to Bethlehem and see this thing which came to pass, the babe, Jesus, lying in a manger. Amen. Jerusalem, 740 BC. It was a dark, frightening and dangerous place. Powerful armies surrounded the land, threatening invasion, murder, occupation and exile. Corrupt leaders ruled within, more concerned with their own status and comfort than the safety of the people. A man who lived in Jerusalem at the time proclaimed a prophecy and that prophecy is recorded in the Bible. 
His words may be familiar, for they were put to music in Handel's Messiah. What is astonishing is how accurate his prophecy was. For God was speaking through the man, Isaiah, holding out a promise of rescue and relief. Something wonderful was on its way. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Sing it!
740 years later, the nation of Israel was living under the rule of yet another occupying force. Centuries of oppression and brutality had taken their toll. The world was just as dark, just as frightening and dangerous as it had been when Isaiah spoke God's promise. But things were about to change. Light was about to break through and the promised child was about to arrive. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her.
the later years of the first century, a doctor named Luke investigated the claims that were being made about Jesus. He tracked down witnesses and interviewed those who had seen and known Jesus himself. We've already begun hearing from Luke. In the early chapters of his book, we're given eyewitness accounts of what happened in the days leading up to Jesus's world-changing birth. Let's rejoin Luke's report to hear what happened next. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told.
The days are cold and the nights are long, but everywhere you look, our city is full of angels. They're blazing down Regent Street and soaring past Piccadilly. They're bursting across Battersea, shimmering and shining around Soho and harking out all over Harrods. Wherever you walk, our city is decorated with heaven, a twinkling host of heavenly splendor, declaring war against the dark and the cold. The days are cold and the nights are long, but in London, we save our brightest and best lights for our longest and coldest nights. And it's not just our best lights that we save up for the winter, we save our best songs too. Everywhere you look, our city is full of angels, and everywhere you listen, you hear the echo of their songs. So the question I have for us is why? 2,000 years ago in the fields outside Little Bethlehem, you'd have been startled by a similar question. Those nights were long and dark and dangerous and nobody knew that better than the shepherds living out in the fields, watching over their flocks by night, cloaks pulled close against the cold, eyes straining against the lurking shadows. So nobody would have been more terrified than they were when an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Nobody would have been more stunned than they were when a great company of the heavenly host appeared, piercing the Bethlehem night with bright song, pulses racing, confusion reigning, one question filling their minds, why? Why are the fields full of angels? The brightness and radiance of angels is electrifying. They soar with the force of the wind in their wings. They flame out like tongues of fire. Their voices are like orchestras and waterfalls and their faces shine like lightning. And the reason that angels burn so brightly and sing so loudly is that they spend their lives basking in the heavenly glory of God. Like a cat before a roaring log fire or a lion beneath the heat of the noonday sun is an angel before the throne of the living God. They sing and shine with his blazing glory like hot steel white from the furnace. Angels love to sing because angels have a God who is worth singing about. Glory to God in the highest is their brightest and best song. Angels sing to fill the earth with the brightness of heaven. They shine with his light and beam with his love. And it's when we begin to realise what makes angels beam so brightly and sing so loudly that we start to realise what makes seeing an angel so terrifying. When the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, God's glory burst and blazed all around them and they were terrified because when you live your life in the dark, God's glory is a terrifying brightness. For those of us who close our eyes to God's glory and shut up our hearts to his love, 
seeing the brightness of an angel would be like a lightning strike in your sleep, like opening your eyes to the sun when you've spent your whole life trying to block it out. We think our worst thoughts in the shadows, when the curtains are closed, when we think no one can see us. But in a light that pure and a glory that bright, nothing unclean would go unnoticed. And that is a terrifying prospect, which only makes our question more pressing. If angels spend their lives singing about God's bright glory and humans spend our lives shutting our eyes to it, then why are these angels singing in Bethlehem? Why have they left the brightness of heaven for the dull darkness of earth? And the answer is, because that's where God has been born. (coughs) Bethlehem is full of angels because that's where God is. He has come down from the everlasting light of heaven to be born in the eyes shut darkness of earth. He has been born in Bethlehem to do what the angels never could, to fill up our darkness with his heavenly light, to open our eyes to his glory and to give us a reason to sing. Bethlehem is full of angels because that's where God has been born and they're singing because he has come to do what they couldn't. See, for all the brightness of angels, All they can do is point us to God. They can shine and they can sing, they can hark and they can herald. But when we choose to ignore the God they're pointing us to, well, there's nothing more that an angel can do. But at Christmas, the God angels sing about came close. At the birth of Jesus, the God we had ignored came near. The Lord of Lords, born in our weakness, the light of heaven, born in our darkness, the bright love of God, born to those of us who had shut him out to offer us pardon and peace. God himself came close and near, and that is wonder enough to make the whole host of heaven sing. But by the end of the Christmas story, it isn't just the angels that are singing. The shepherds have taken up the song too, filling the night with the praises of the God who is worth singing about, the God who came close and near. And as the years have rolled on, that song has only grown and spread. The song of a God who would be born to us, the song of a God who would die for us, the song of a God who would walk out of his own grave to offer us life in his name. A song of good news a song of great joy, a song for all people, a saviour has been born. It began in Bethlehem, but it didn't stay there. It echoed out from Bethlehem to Beirut, from Nazareth to Nairobi, and from Jerusalem to Jackson and Jakarta and St John's Wood. Herod tried to kill it, the Romans tried to bury it, but it would be easier to smother the sun with a blindfold. And one day, angels will fill the skies for a second time, as the Jesus who was born to us, the Jesus who died for us, the Jesus who walked out of his own grave, returns to earth, robed in glory, to banish our darkness once and for all. So as I close, I wonder, when the nights are long, do you have a reason to keep singing? When Jesus comes again in glory, his angels filling the sky, will you be shutting your eyes or joining their song? This Christmas, I want to invite you to share in the wonder of the shepherds, to join the song of the angels by meeting the God who was born in Bethlehem. This world has so many reasons to stop us from singing and each one of us will have many reasons of our own to try to hide in the dark. But at the birth of Jesus, the God angels sing about came close and the God we've ignored came near. The days are cold and the nights are long, but everywhere you look, angels are singing about Jesus. So this year, this Christmas, will you join in with their song?